Hello, we are back uh, at the Piedes New York uh, for the scalability uh, track. Uh, and we will start with the first topic about uh, GraphQL APIs. Uh, you know, GraphQL is a technology that has been open sourced by Hello, Facebook. Hello, we are back. Uh, uh, that has been open, by, uh, open sourced by Facebook, sorry, uh, in 2015. And that had a lot of developer traction, a lot of developer success. And so yeah, there's lots, even some controversy about uh, how uh, is it good at large scale? But let's say its adoption uh, can cannot make anyone indifferent, um, and and developers really uh, love GraphQL. This is why we wanted to have uh, Tanmai uh, coming uh, um, to speak uh, with us about productizing API with GraphQL. Uh, and uh, yes, Tanmai is the CEO of uh, Hasura, uh, quite a uh, an exciting and promising uh, startup in the API space. And uh, yes, so the big question that we'll try to address is like, yeah, uh, GraphQL is trendy. GraphQL is quite powerful for a lot of use cases. But yeah, uh, how can we really productize APIs, uh, productify data with GraphQL APIs? So Tanmai, are you able to come on stage? Hello, yeah, Tanmai. Hey, 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 everybody. Yeah, uh, so please share your screen and tell us your story about product, productizing data with GraphQL APIs. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, folks. All right, let me share my screen. Cool. All right. So like Mary said, I'm going to talk a little bit about productifying data with GraphQL APIs. So um, let's let's dive right in, right? Um, the, the first question is, you know, why should I productify my data, right? And, and you know, kind of what is the motivation or what are we talking about here? Um, what, what we're saying is that, uh, and, and kind of the context that you know a lot of us are operating in now is that th there's a tremendous amount of data, right? It's exploding, it's uh, proliferating, it's going into different kinds of data sources, it's just everywhere, right? And the value of this data is also increasing because we're kind of doing more with that data. We're building applications with it, we're, we're giving it to our partners, right? And we're making it kind of useful for people, right? As owners of data. Um, when we think about kind of uh, delivering this data to to our developers or to both internal or external developers, they they want access to this data, right? Um, and they want to be able to kind of interact with that data. Sometimes these are folks within our team, like maybe it's an application that we're building and they want to connect to our data, right? Maybe it's somebody in a different team in the same organization and they need to use a little bit of our data, right? Or maybe it's an external developer, it's a partner, uh, uh, it's a partner organization, right? Or it's a customer who wants to kind of use our data. Um, and so in those cases, when they kind of want access to this data, um, one way that we, there's several ways to kind of give them access to data, right? We can give them, um, you know, direct access to our data sources. We can kind of do batch systems. We can export data to them, right? Um, but, but really kind of the future here is to try, is to start thinking about our data as a managed service, right? Like what if our data was actually a SaaS API, right? What, what, if, what would that experience look like? Um, and, you know, kind of what is the benefit that we would have there, right? Um, and of course, uh, the, the idea here, and when we kind of think about uh, delivering our data, right, as a product or as a service, um, that, that, that the, 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 the one of the biggest kind of things there is to think about it as we're making, we're making this experience self-serve, right? So instead of us kind of doing manual things, putting a bunch of hacks together, right? What we really want to do is provide access that is as self-serve as possible to our uh, data. Um, apologies if you can hear my cat in the background. Uh, hopefully my cat uh, uh, does, not, uh, does not keep screaming. But uh, in any case, that's kind of how we want to start thinking about our, uh, about our data, right? We want to kind of make it self-serve. We want to have a self-serve experience for our consumers uh, so that they can start interacting with it. Now, Technically, when we think about what we need to do here, right? Functionally, uh, in the different ways that we interact with our data, we we want to read data, we want to write to our data, right? And we want to increasingly start to subscribe to our data, right? Because we have events and notifications, right? That's kind of also a big part of what modern data looks like and how what data is kind of moving towards, right? Um, and so whatever kind of primitive we give to our customers when they are our consumers who are interacting with this data needs to support kind of these functional requirements. Maybe all of them, maybe a subset of them. Similarly, um, we have a bunch of non-functional requirements, right? Which is, if, especially if we start thinking of our data as a, as a product, right? Um, 
which is that we kind of want to have a certain amount of guaranteed performance, right? No matter what our consumers do, right? We want to be able to provide a certain uh, a, a certain guarantee on performance, right? Kind of exactly like a SaaS API, right? Which is you you expect it to work within a certain performance kind of threshold, right? Similarly, we have um, security, right? Um, again, if you think about your data as a SaaS API, right? Um, you want it to be secure for your customers and for your consumers um, and to have kind of protection so that you have like denial of service protection or DDoS protection and stuff like that as well, right? And then of course you need things like observability so that you're able to maintain this, right? And, and provide uh, a certain quality of service to different kinds of tenants or users of this data, right? So that's kind of what we need. Now, if you think about you know, should we have an API as a product to deliver? Should we should we have a should we deliver our data over an API? Now, when I say API here, what I actually mean is an HTTP API, right? Every every way of interacting with the system is an API. I mean, technically, when you're using a database, you're using a SQL API, right? But what I mean here when I say API is an HTTP API, right? Um, if if we don't provide a direct, if you don't provide an API, then one of the options is that you provide direct access to your data sources, right? Um, and if you do that, um, the operational problem is that it's a, it's a TCP kind of connection. It's not a stateless HTTP API. This doesn't gel well with modern consumers of data, right? Because they want a stateless HTTP API. Um, similarly, if you don't have an API boundary, um, it's going to be hard to control or govern access, right? If you give somebody direct access to a system, um, it's hard. It's possible, uh, but it's hard, right? It's not. It's not easy to think about as as a as as a business, right? Uh, from a control and governance standpoint. Um, now, if we have an API, we of course need it to support the technical primitives. Now, if you think about read, write, subscribe events. Um, databases that support that technically already have those primitives, right? You have a way to select and insert and update and delete and listen and notify or subscribe to a stream. So the API also needs to have these primitives now, right? Which is, if we think about this as an API. And then, of course, it needs to be flexible, right? One of the nice things about interacting with a data and with a database directly is that, you know, things like SQL or database query languages are pretty awesome because they're flexible. Right. If you are the owner of this database, it's so easy for you to kind of interact with that system, right? And APIs feel so restrictive, right? Traditionally, when we think about HTTP APIs or REST APIs, especially, they feel very restrictive because it, it, it's an endpoint. It's a predefined shape of data, and I'm not going to be able to do anything else beyond it, right? Um, so it feels restrictive. It doesn't feel as awesome as having SQL, right? What what we want really is the best of both of these. We want that API level control, but we kind of want that flexibility of being able to interact with data the way that we want to. So that kind of brings us to GraphQL, right? Um, Nice thing about GraphQL is that it's flexible. It's it's almost like a SQL, but for APIs. That's kind of what GraphQL is like. And we look at a demo uh, in a bit to see really what a GraphQL API looks like for those of you who are not familiar with GraphQL. Um, the nice thing also uh, with having an API, especially a GraphQL API, um, and, and technically this is possible with any API, but with GraphQL, it becomes much easier to think of it as an API that's surfacing not just one data source, but multiple data sources, uh, which is neat because often the API or the semantic model that you want to expose of your data might actually be split across several different physical models, right? That are that are present in your data systems, right? Um, and they're kind of interconnected and things like that. And GraphQL is a really nice way to think about those interconnected models that kind of then get unified into a semantic graph of your data, right? And again, we're not talking about graph databases, right? Um, uh, graph databases are kind of unique in the sense that we are running lots of graph operations on it. What we're talking about it is, 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 is more the fact that your data is uh, almost always very naturally a a logical or a semantic graph, right? If an e-commerce situation, you have users, users have passed orders, orders have items. Each item actually has a has a SKU, right? Has a brand, right? It's a it's a kind of a linked graph of things. Doesn't mean we're making graph queries, but it does mean that we're kind of thinking of our entire data model uh, as 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 a graph, right? As a semantic graph. Um, then the other nice thing about GraphQL is that it does support all of these modern primitives 
that we want, right? You can query, which is reads, mutate, which is writes, subscribe, or stream, which is that you can subscribe to events or stream data as it's coming, right? And that is baked into the GraphQL semantics. GraphQL itself is kind of like a layer, right, on top of HTTP. Um, uh, so, so that kind of makes it that kind of makes it a nice API. It gives us the benefits of HTTP, but it also gives us nice semantics for doing the things that we would have traditionally wanted to do with our data, right? Um, the cons for GraphQL, which is that well, it's a new thing, right? And if it's a new thing, it's a new things to worry about, right? Because, well, it's a new GraphQL API, I have a new GraphQL client and stuff like that. Um, and, and, and apart from kind of some of those challenges of it being a new thing, which has a lot of kind of peripheral things that you have to think about, uh, one of those other things is that you have to start really changing the way that you think from an endpoint way of thinking to a query way of thinking, right? And this has an impact from an API point of view. When you have API endpoints, and you think about caching, you're caching a particular, enabling caching on a particular endpoint, which is nice. But now you need to think about caching at a query, right? Because there can be dynamic queries. People can query for what they want. They're not restricted to a endpoint that is giving them a, a fixed slice of data. People are now querying for, for the slice of data that they want, right? Like I want users, I only want ID and email. I want users, I want ID, email, and the last uh, five recent addresses, right? So they're choosing what data they want, which means that we're moving away from endpoint thinking to query thinking, which then has an impact on, like I said, caching, also on things like rate limiting, right? Like you could have had the quality of service control or a denial of service protection for an endpoint, but now you need to bring that into your query style of thinking, right? Um, and then of course, API's endpoint security, which is a little bit easier to think about because you can just be like, you know what? let's not expose this endpoint to this user. It's pretty straightforward, right? But now you're thinking about queries, right? So you're thinking about this model should not be exposed. So any query that is touching this model should not work, right? That, that, that style of thinking changes a little bit. Cool. So with that rough introduction and that rough context, uh, what we'll do is we'll take a look at a bunch of all of these things with GraphQL in action. Um, and I'll be using Hasura for kind of showing you what this looks like um, and what kind of these some of these ideas look like in action. Cool. So with that, give me a quick second while I uh, chuck my cat out. And while you see a screen here. You know, this is a uh, fun pandemic talks. So, uh, all right. So, when we think about uh, when we think about kind of you know Hasura, right? What, what we do with Hasura is that we we think about kind of exactly this problem, right? Which is that you have databases, one or more databases, um, and what you want to do is expose an API over it, right? And so, what Hasura does, and it's, an, it's an open source service that we uh, launched in twenty eighteen. Um, and, and you can kind of run Hasura as a container, right? And I'm running this container locally on my system. Um, once you run Hasura as a container, it becomes the GraphQL API. And then you can start connecting in databases to Hasura. And Hasura will expose an API on top of that, uh, on top of those data systems, right? Um, and so here, this is our API endpoint. You can see that it's a, um, you know, it's localhost slash v1 slash GraphQL. Here in this interface, I'm just going to zoom this up a tiny bit. What we're going to be doing is running GraphQL queries, and we'll be seeing responses here, right? That's kind of what a GraphQL query looks like. You can, of course, run these GraphQL queries from wherever you want, um, from you know your, your terminal client, from your application, from other services, right? Uh, that, that doesn't matter. But this is the endpoint, and this is the GraphQL query. Underneath it, a GraphQL query is just a payload, right? This payload is sent as a post body to this endpoint. And then this query is processed by a GraphQL server and it returns a JSON response. That's what we kind of see here in action. Now, the second piece of this is, uh, and this is with Hasura, is that we're connecting different databases into our system here, right? So I can kind of go in here and say, you know, connect database, and I can bring in a database you know, with a secret or with a connection string or whatever it is. And as soon as I bring that in, what Hasura does, uh, and what I kind of see here on the on the on the UI, um, which is kind of the control plane uh, for Hasura, is I see the different models, tables, views, functions, stored queries, whatever it is that exist in my data system, right? Um, and and what Hasura lets me do is take any of those models and get a GraphQL API from those models, right? So let's take a super quick example. Um, I have an actors model in my system, so I'm going to just track it. What Hasura has done 
is it's gone to the database catalog and it's inferred the model there and it's converted that and made that available over an API. So let's take a look at what the API looks like and see what all we can do there. So I can do query, actors, ID, and let's say first name, right? Um, and so this is the JSON response that I get here. Now, uh, just as a quick brief on GraphQL so that you folks can see what GraphQL is all about. Um, this is the syntax here, and this, this syntax is GraphQL. This kind of looks like the skeleton of the JSON that I want, right? Which is why developers really like using a GraphQL API. The rest equivalent for this endpoint would have been something like, you know, slash get slash actors, right? That's kind of what it would have been like. But the nice thing here, is because it's a GraphQL query, I can query for what slice of the data I want. So I can say, you know what, I don't want first, I want first name and last name, right? And and the problem here that I would have seen is that in a REST endpoint, I would have just I would have gotten a fixed payload, right? And and uh, the number of fields that I might have for this resource that might actually be quite large, right? Um, and that kind of brings us to the other benefit of GraphQL, especially when we think about it as a data API, which is that I can kind of start seeing the different fields that I have available um, because every GraphQL API automatically publishes its documentation as well, right? So it publishes that documentation automatically. Any GraphQL API will publish that, right? And so that allows me to see what those different models are, right? So I can I can see, ah, well, I have ID and first name, right? I can also see the different arguments that I can pass to the system. So I can say, I want um, to sort this by the first name, but in descending order, right? So that's kind of what this looks like. Arguments kind of go in here, right? And again, if you think about it from a self-serve experience, the API experience is nice because I can start kind of browsing the data that I have, the different arguments that I can send it, the way that I would do pagination, for example, right? Like, and let's say, let's remove this and let's say limit. And I want I want the first 10, I want to offset it by another 10, right? And I can start kind of fetching uh, the right pieces of data that I would want to, right? And this is kind of what makes uh, GraphQL nice. Let's take another look. We were looking at reads. Let's take another quick look at what events or subscriptions would look like. So I'll do a subscription um, and let's do actors. Let's do ID one, right? So I'm kind of, I'm trying, I'm subscribing to the actor model where the uh, ID is one, right? So let's get their ID and let's get their first name. Cool. All right. So I'm getting this field here. Now, the nice thing here um, with the way this is working internally is what has happened is that we've, whenever I run a GraphQL subscription um, over HTTP, it's opened up a WebSocket connection um, that is subscribing to this model now, right? Um, and what I can, if any change happens to this model, I'm just going to switch to a tab and let's go in and make a change to this particular data here. So let's change this to Mary. This is kind enough to introduce me. So let's do that. And as soon as I change that here, we'll see that this is kind of automatically refreshed, right? So what Hasura is doing is Hasura has kind of set up the plumbing, right? To listen to database events, kind of do the work, right? And and send the latest value, right? The latest, the, the, the live query of what that result is, right? And that's kind of easy with GraphQL subscriptions, right? If you think about it from the API consumption point of view, right? It's nice. I don't have to think about anything. Um, it's it's semantically very convenient, right? I just subscribe to things. I can choose what parts of data to subscribe to. And I kind of see that in action, right? Um, let's take a look at another quick example where we'll be trying to join this across data sources, not just within a data source. And we kind of have our graph of data. So what I've done here in this slightly contrived example is I have set up a Postgres database as one of our data sources, which has a music database, but a part of the music database. So I have artists, music artists, that are present in a table in Postgres. And similarly, I have a SQL Server database where I've put the albums model, right? Now, technically, uh, my artists and albums are kind of related to each other, but they're in different places, right? From an API point of view, I would really like to query artists and their albums simultaneously. That's the ideal API experience I would like to have as an API consumer of this data, right? What Hasura allows us to do is set up relationships and kind of federate across these two systems so that we can kind of query that, uh, we can query across these two systems, right? So I've set up a relationship um, between the artist and the album model by specifying a join condition, right? Uh, conceptually a join condition. Um, and then Hasura executes that and federates that for me. So let's take a look at what that looks like. 
um, I can again hit the explorer here. Let's go and query artists and ID and name. That's nice. So I'm getting ID and name here. Let's limit that to 10 so that we can see what's happening. Right. Now, what I can also do is say, well, I also want albums. And albums have a title. So here, this data is coming in from Postgres. And here, this data is coming in from SQL Server, right? But it feels like one unified API. It feels like the semantic model, the semantic graph that I have of artists and albums is preserved, right, for me as an API consumer. It's convenient, right? Um, and then similarly, I have music tracks. Each album has multiple music tracks, right? Um, and then I can fetch those tracks as well. So let's fetch that. And now what we're doing here is we're fetching data, you know, artists, which is coming in from Postgres. This data, which is coming in from SQL Server, which is second database, and tracks, which is coming back from Postgres, right? I've, I've structured the model in, in that kind of way, right? So this kind of makes it easy for me to now, uh, you know, fed it across these different systems, create, create kind of a unified model, a unified API for my data, and then people can start using it, right? So this is kind of what GraphQL looks like. This is kind of a little bit of what Hasura does as well. Um, and to, to automate the process of building that GraphQL API and those operational challenges there. Um, and uh, and of course, we also, uh, we've also we've also done a tremendous amount of work in doing things like security and rate limiting and whatnot around GraphQL as well, so that you can rate limit, you can have operation timeouts, you can have cost, cost quota limits so that somebody's running a query and it's not, if it's too long, the query will get killed and stuff like that. So we've done very interesting work there and we've talked about it a lot. So uh, you know, feel free to kind of um, uh, join us on GitHub and kind of read through specifications and implementations and things like that there. Um, you'll find it on Hasura slash GraphQL engine, so on GitHub. Um, and uh, of course, there's a lot of stuff here that we can uh, that we can go into, but uh, I'll pause for uh, last few minutes of questions if we have some time. Uh, but that is a quick overview of GraphQL for data. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, Tanmay. We have one question about the monitoring performance on GraphQL mm -hmm. APIs, because when you, you show that you, uh, uh, you, uh, you get data from a, a Postgre uh, database or from a, a SQL server, like how can you, at large scale in a large organization, be sure that when the field you add into uh, into the request is not actually getting too much resource from the system. Yep, yep, that's a very good question. Um, so what Hasura does is it instruments each part of its processing uh, with uh, with tracing and with query tags, right? So whenever a GraphQL operation runs on Hasura, um, Hasura creates an execution plan for it, and then when it's sending those queries to the upstream system. It sends the right tag, so it sends a GraphQL request ID or an operation ID, uh, the name of the GraphQL query that you created there. So you said query get artists, and then you said whatever you want uh, or or the operation hash. So it takes a bunch of those uh, fields and it sends that along with the, the SQL query or the database query. If it's Mongo, it'll be like a Mongo query uh, uh, to the database as well. So now when you look at when you look at the performance of an API, you see that the API is slow. For example, right? You go to the Hasura monitoring system. Hasura shows your trace of what is happening and how much time is getting spent where. You can also go to your database monitoring tool and say, why is my database like at 60% CPU, right? Or like, do I need more read replicas? What is happening? Um, and so you can go there and trace and see what your top kind of resource consuming queries are, see the tag, and you'll see the GraphQL operation or the GraphQL query that it's coming from. And then you can decide what to do about it. Do you want to cache it? Do you want to set up rate limiting around it, right? Do you want to set up a cost quota? Um, so that uh, that query is allowed to be used, but only if there's enough pagination or like limits on it uh, that the end user is supposed to think of themselves, right? They should not try to run a query and fetch the whole thing. They should paginate. To encourage that good behavior, you want to give them a cost limit. So those are kinds of things that Hasura comes with. And that, I mean, when you're thinking about GraphQL, those are the kinds of things that you'd want to build yourself if you're building a GraphQL API yourself. In the last 30 seconds for the question, we have one question about uh, authentication and authorization. Is it mature enough in the GraphQL ecosystem? That's a, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, 
No, <laughs> it's not uh, in the ecosystem, right? But we've done a tremendous amount of work at Hasura to check it out. So what, and there's many different ways of doing GraphQL authorization. Uh, what we've done is a system very similar to RLS in the database ecosystem. So what we allow you to do is take any part of the graph, any model in the graph, and specify security rules on that model. So you can say entity level, row level security, or column level security, or field level security. And Hasura will compose that into an authorization rule um, automatically. So you can restrict access to certain parts of the graph, to only certain rows and entities in the graph. And it's extremely flexible and granular. So that's some of the work that we have done. But uh, but you know the question is spot on. Um, the nature of GraphQL doesn't make it easy for uh, there to be a, a vendor standard around authorization. Right? It's uh, People do it in different ways. So it's possible to do. It is definitely something to think through. Uh, with Hasra, we've done a good job of it. You should definitely check it out. And that might spark some ideas for you to think about how you want to think about authorization. But uh, but that's the uh, long and short of it. Yeah, the community is asking the the, the right question. <laughs> Thank you very exactly. much, Tanmay. Uh, Asura is a great platform for GraphQL. Uh, so I invite you to check uh, if you're interested into uh, productizing data with GraphQL APIs. Thank you very much, Tanmay. Glad Thanks to have you. Me,